Thank you all for being here today to celebrate women's history and commemorate the heroic women who have preceded us and gotten us to where we are today. Of course, there's still a lot of work to do, and we're going to start some of that work today. As we continue to push for true equality, inclusion, and opportunity for women, both here at home, in Baltimore, in Maryland, and in the nation, and I thank you all for being here and committing to the cause. These annual celebrations are really a reminder of all that we have done and the reminder that there is still so much more to do as we fight to keep workplaces free from sexual harassment and discrimination and as we level our attention on eliminating the entrenched systems and structures that even today inhibit true wage equality in, for women and gender parity in the workplace. So our work goes on and Umbrella's work goes on as we strive to make a difference right here, right now. And right now, we're all here because we want to be catalysts for change in our lives and in our careers. And in order to do that, we must start our program. So I'm going to stop talking, and I am going to welcome our president, Jay Perman, to the podium. Welcome. Welcome to our celebration of Women's History Month. Uh, it's a great opportunity, as Jennifer said, uh, to build networks among our UMB women, uh, to share with one another uh, and learn from one another. So I really do hope that this day uh, brings you some good advice, strategies, and connections. I can't stay for all of it, but uh, I'm planning to come back uh, at lunch. So. Uh, we'll have a very good morning session, I know, and uh, continue it throughout the day. Now, I have a great honor. Uh, I have the honor of uh, introducing uh, this morning's featured guest, uh, who is an enormously successful entrepreneur, now embarking on the next phase of her career. In 1994, so that's 25 years ago, May she founded Pacific Trade International, and its signature brand, which you've all heard of, Chesapeake Bay Candle. In 2017, Ms. She sold Chesapeake Bay Candle for $75 million. She's on the board of the World Affairs Council. She's a fellow at the Aspen Institute, a member of the U.S.-China Business Council, a delegate to Fortune's Most Powerful Women's Summit, and a mentor with Global Women's Mentoring Partnership, sponsored by Fortune and the U.S. State Department. Less than a week ago, the Meridian Center for Cultural Diplomacy celebrated International Women's Day by naming Ms. Xi as its chair. What a fitting homecoming for someone who years ago trained to be an, a diplomat. Now, I've told you about all these glorious recognitions, but the most important one, at least to this guy, is the fact that Meishi is a valued member of our University of Maryland Baltimore Foundation Board. Uh, All of the rest of what I told you pales by comparison. <laughs> and I hope you know how much I appreciate our partnership and your valued counsel and uh, your honoring us today. So if I may, to uh, borrow a phrase from President Barack Obama, it's my privilege to introduce that candle lady, <laughs> May she. So I thought we might start by uh, you quickly telling us uh, your road to this point, your path to entrepreneurship, and to running and eventually selling a powerhouse company. What's the story? So, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Ex excellent. Um, so as Dr. Perman said, I was um, as actually an immigrant. So I was born raised during um, the Cultural Revolution of China. So you could say I was a child of two China. China that was 
the Chairman Mao era, which everybody probably recall, very gray, uh, very homogeneous. Not a place that really inspire innovation or design or anything um, uh, progressive. Uh, quickly, 1972, uh, President Nixon visited not only Beijing, but also my hometown. Therefore, uh, paved the way for China's second China that I knew, which was uh, slightly more open. And in 1979, I was enrolled as one of the students to pursue a diplomatic training at the age of 12. I must say, this is such a great um, background for me. Many people ask me, how did you have the confidence as a new immigrant to start a business here? And I would thank my education. Um, the, when I was 12, I was in a boarding program. It was in an immersion language training. As you know, that means subjects are taught in English uh, and given by native speakers from around the world where English was um, a native tongue. So from Australia, from England, from the United States. Even today, as I look around, I have four children in four different high schools in Maryland and DC. The English language offered or the foreign language offered was never in such a manner. So immersion way of educating a foreign language has helped me not only to, um, I would say, speak the language, but really the culture. As we know, um, it's a very different thing to learn a language versus uh, learning history or politics. So equipped it with that, I went to Beijing Foreign Studies University, which is a finishing school for China's uh, diplomat. Um, during that time, I was fortunate enough to, met, to meet a lot of the you know, missions that includes the UN and the World Bank. And I worked for them, and it, it really gave me the opportunity of a taste of what it is like working in a very international, a very diverse uh, organization with a lot of women, by the way, that are not just um, bank staff, but scientists, consultants with very specific expertise. And it was probably the first time that I really aspire to work in that kind of environment where people from different culture really complement each other in decision making, in the way we solve problems in different parts of the world when the World Bank was investing. Unfortunately, my dream did not really uh, realize in the fact that I graduated in the year 1989. So who remember what happened in China in 1989, in June of 1990, uh, 1989? Um, the Tiananmen Square. Some are too young. Uh, some are too young. <laughs> Obviously, you probably um, have seen the picture of a tank uh, in front of a student. That was the year that I was graduated. Uh, I graduated that year, so um, many things happened that most people outside of China probably didn't know. One of them was that the graduating year will all get to send outside of Beijing so that they're not able to uh, collectively make a lot of uh, trouble for the government. And I was sent to work in a very remote part of China in the mm -hmm. north. My job was to look after um, minerals that are going to be exported for China. So I did not have anybody to speak to, not in English, not in Chinese. I have a clipboard. In the morning, a truck come, and I would give a check. That's my morning's job. The afternoon, it came again, and that's it. So I was there for about a month, and I said, you know, I've been learning English for 10 years, and I need someone to speak to me. I'm going to go crazy like this. So I did something unthinkable at that time. I quit, which for China, as you can imagine, is a very uh, state-owned economy. That means I would never be allowed back into the diplomatic corp, and I would never be allowed to work for a state company. So that's where I started to apply for uh, graduate degrees, um, graduate education, and I was fortunate to, um, to have a very good uh, you know, opportunity to study 
mass communication and journalism at University of Maryland in College Park. That's why when Dr. Perman's uh, team approached me, uh, I was very flattered. And it was such a way for me to re-engage with a university that's given me a lot of opportunity. So long story short, after graduating, once again, something happened to my dream to work for the World Bank, which is called the First Gulf War. Our country was in war with Iraq. And the bank being the number one donor for um, the, the, the US being the number one donor for uh, the World Bank, they had a, what we call a hiring freeze. And they say, may you just you know, find something to do in the meantime. And a few years later, when we, when we finished the war, you'll be uh, working for us again. And that never happened, as you probably know. And I'm so happy to say that I didn't end up in the perfect job and happy to fly around the world. Many people think those setbacks um, is not good for us because it kind of destroyed our dream. You know, we have to start from scratch. I would always say be very careful about those assumptions. I actually think it is precisely why I started um, a complete journey. I was uh, working on a very uninspiring job. My first job was in New York. What's very inspiring about it is that they put me in a hotel right next to the Bloomingdale's. Imagine, you all want that. <laughs> imagine someone who has never really seen the amount of merchandise, like a bird, let free in the capital of merchandise. Um, so I don't know many people. You know, I was a young, new immigrant, but I have a ton of time. So every day after work, I allow myself to window shopping inside Bloomingdale. And people, you know, they would spray fragrances at you. Do you remember those ladies? And most people say, please don't spray on me. I would say, please spray on me. What did you have today? <laughs> and they got really surprised because not only do I ask what they have, I would ask them how much does it cost, what are the fragrances I'm smelling, and then they get a little nervous. Are you doing research with us? You know, they thought I'm one of those, um, you know, fragrance. You're from Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> I scared them, I think. So every day when I went to the fashion floor, as you know, it's usually the second floor. It's Donna Karen, it's Kevin Klein. Very minimalist, very stylish in my view. Uh, not very busy prints and, you know, grandma's shape. So I was very happy to see that. And then when you walk up, the more you walk up, the more dated they look. When you go up to the home, you practically are landing yourself in your grandma's home because the furniture is very ornate, you know, with all these gold and um, the, the fabrics are very re repetitive, like a wallflower. And I just mm -hmm. can't make those two connections. Remember, I just came to the US. So I was pretty much presented without too much of a historical background, but with a contrast in front of me. Home is very traditional, but fashion is very on. It's contemporary, you know, women was giving the same fabric as men, and they feel very confident. So I said, why would a woman go wear this and then go home to this? Um, is it just because they don't have options, or is it because uh, someone haven't really started thinking about home yet? And every night, I was talking to my then husband, David. I said, this is, I don't understand this. I don't understand that. And one day, he finally said, enough, May. <laughs> You're not happy you know, commuting between DC and Washington. Why don't you quit? And by the way, I will quit too. We'll do this together. We'll do something with home. So there's benefit of not having kids, dogs, and mortgage, which is <laughs> go for it. So I a lot think, of nodding heads. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, it's uh, home ownership is always a goal. But I think when you're young, don't get yourself a home. Don't bog yourself down with those uh, life's burdens. But um, so long story short, we both quit. And we just know we want to get into home product. We don't know what product. As you know, there's the name Pacific Trade suggests. We don't know what we're doing initially. Um, one of the things I, 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 I would mention over and over is how important it is to really take the, the, the dip and go to the market and let the market give you answer. So we brought a lot of samples. Remember, I was in foreign trade. Not everybody can become ambassadors, clearly. So there are many people who end up in glo uh, international trade um, in China that are friends of mine or classmates of mine. So they gave me a lot of ideas, a lot of samples. 
Um, I remember in 1994, in September, there was only one uh, wholesale trade show left. It was in North Carolina, in Charlotte. It's a very small regional show. Mom and pop stores would go there to stock up for Christmas. So we, get, we, we got into that show. I have photos where I have you know, all kinds of silk flowers, you know, musical dolls, all kinds of home product with some candles. And that's what I really want to share is that that market told us everything we need to know. 90% of my $60,000 orders from mom and pop stores came to the candle. It's the smallest item, but I put them on the, on the, on the front desk, uh, front table, and all the orders I wrote, 60%, 90% of them, actually 90% of them was for that candle. So that's kind of told us what we need to focus. For the first year where we went into business in September, we did over $500,000 of mostly candles. And that success is what continued. So I'm a candle lady, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for not being able to get accepted to my dream job. So that's fascinating. You know, if, if I kept track of it, uh, you started out even at the age of 12, you said, by training to be a diplomat. And then happily for us, you completed a journalism communications degree at the University of Maryland doesn't sound directly like diplomacy. And then you went to New York, and you worked at a, for, a firm in international trade, happily right next door to Bloomingdale's. Uh, and then, all of a sudden, you're launching an incredibly successful global company of your own. So, if I may, that sounds a little zigzaggy to me. Uh, you know, in a place like this, we always tell the students and the faculty, stay focused, keep your eye on the ball. But I think what you're convincing us of is that there may be some merit uh, in exploring different careers, different passions, uh, until you land on the one that fits. Is that what we're to learn? Um, absolutely. I okay. always feel, I always feel that um, one of the biggest things that differentiate at least businesswomen entrepreneurs, it's the passion. Um, maybe that's what drives a lot of us to do things only entrepreneurs can think about it. Getting up early at 4 o'clock, taking that flight, going to uh, Minneapolis. I, I know our co-speaker in the afternoon is from Minneapolis. And come back in the evening to take care of the kids. Mm -hmm. Those are not things that everybody wants to aspire to do if it's something that you have to do for, for your work. But if it's something you are passionate about, you wouldn't be tired. Um, so I don't know if the training necessarily always will prepare you for what you're going to be the most passionate about. A lot of us take time during our education to identify opportunities. You know, one of the things that you probably can see, I find a gap between home and between fashion. And I decided to be the gap closer. That's the opportunity for entrepreneurs. So wherever that gap exists, is probably where your next career will be. Even now, I, I keep telling my son, who is going to college, and he wants to be an architect. What's that, son? One of the things you want to be careful with is to tell everybody you will be an architect. You never know. Maybe you become you know, an industrial designer that focuses on, on the architectural field. So it's really about finding that gap, that opportunity that no one else has really focused on. So. Um you sound like a risk taker. I mean, after all, uh, I mean, I listen to you very carefully. Uh, in a very autocratic society, you quit. Mm -hmm. That's risk taking. Uh, mm -hmm. You explain that to us. But you've also told me if we can get to gender in this Women's History Month celebration, you've told me that uh, your perspective is that women have a tendency to be cautious. Uh, a tendency that you don't see as much in men. And you feel, at least I think I've heard you say this, that this tendency uh, can depress entrepreneurship among women. So I'm curious, yeah, I'm curious as to uh, what you think accounts for this cautiousness. 
And uh, how does a woman in particular, since we're talking gender, overcome this tendency to be overly cautious? Now, some of you may not agree with what I've said, but I think that's what May taught me. Please. Well, um, in my years growing the business, I have worked with many men and many women. I probably have more women working for me uh, than men. One of the things I identify is that even though in my company I was the CEO, I was the founder, it's less frequent for, men, uh, for women to come in to me and say, I think I'm ready to grow to the next level. Uh, when there's an opportunity and I was interviewing, let's say, a creative director, more men designers will come forward and say, I'm ready for that. I've worked for agencies for eight years. I've worked for you for three years. I'm ready. Women seem to wait for themselves to get enough credential and, and, and sort of like a um, resume. Um, a lot of nodding in the room. You're is, that, is that true for you? Because that's what my experience is. And as I also become um, more engaged with other women uh, in C200, with the most powerful women's summit um, in uh, the Fortune uh, world, a lot of times uh, it seems that we are our worst self-critic. We always say, well, I could have gotten another EMBA while I'm doing XYZ, or this is not the best time for me because my children are going to apply for high school or university or my husband is going to take on this job to really be very busy and someone needs to. So we accidentally give ourselves a lot of reason not to pursue some of the most ambitious goals and the most daring dreams. Um, I don't know about you, but I do think there is the building problem of, not problem, but challenge as a mother, as a wife. We are the homemaker. I'm the homemaker in my house. I can raise the hand. Um, you know, I was actually a single mother for many, many years. So that is automatically on my, on my side. So I travel, rather than staying longer, hang out with the leaders of my community, I came home to take care of the boys. So that automatically took me out of that power wow session, right? All these moments where actual decisions are made, um, you know, relationship are cemented, promotions are discussed. I was out of those pictures. I'm talking about boards that um, are important when those conversations take place. So um, I do feel that's a challenge. Um, but as I can share with you, a lot of times um, I see with, with more and more women coming to start their own business, taking on leadership roles in the organization, we're pushing women to really um, go forward. And that is something I really want to you know, share with you is that you are ready. The readiness does not come from your resume or what you have done. It's what you're willing to do. It's your attitude. It counts for more than anything on your resume. And that, I speak to, to all of you. It's the attitude at the end of the day. We could end on that, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Uh, let's talk about mentoring, because you and I have talked about that in the past. I know you believe that uh, seeking out an appropriate mentor uh, is very critical for an aspiring entrepreneur to do. Uh, but interestingly, uh, you've also said that uh, women often don't give themselves permission to seek out mentors, even peers. So what's your advice to entrepreneurs, particularly women, uh, in seeking out and developing mentoring relationships. And you might also comment on something that uh, often creeps up as a controversy. Do women need women mentors? What about the gender aspect of this? Please talk about mentorship. This is a loaded question. Uh, very big. It's my very job. Big. <laughs> very big. I didn't know that Dr. Perman has a journalist degree, <laughs> putting me on the hot spot. But I'll answer it. Um, I'll answer the last question first, addressing the men in this, uh, in this, uh, po uh, in this uh, group, because I really want to thank all of you to come here. Um, I think the difference between women in charge and men in charge is we never want to weaken the stronger one 
we actually want to just strengthen the weaker one. Does that make a difference? We want everyone to become competitive, and we think it's more fun when there's a lot of competitiveness in any, um, in any industry, in any field, in any community, because that is where strength really are born. So to me, uh, I don't really look at gender as an issue for choosing who my mentor is. Um, when you're working in brand, in manufacturing, honestly, there's not a lot of women I can identify at that point to be my mentor. Um, I seek mentors for their capability, for their, um, for their professionalism that they demonstrated, and it's something that I feel has benefited me. Um, I didn't really seek out mentorship when I was uh, just graduating. I remember I was working for the World Bank, and there was a very good uh, boss at that time. He's actually working here. Um, his name is Mr. Cabo Martin. Uh, he has left us five years ago. He's from Switzerland and an engineer that um, is in the water and the sanitation area. So when he visited China for the first time, I was his translator. I just started working for the bank. And I didn't know some of the terminology, as you can imagine. What is a latrine? <laughs> At that time, I didn't know what a latrine is. So why don't you just use the word toilet, you know, Mr. Carver Martin? Well, so he said, because we have a lot of French-speaking um, you know, countries that are donors of the World Bank, this is a word we use throughout our report. I think it's kind of bureaucracy, but at that time, they stuck with that word. So from there on, he gave me a lot of little lectures before I translate so we don't waste time on the actual meetings that I really understand what he's talking about. So he became my first unofficial um, mentor, mm -hmm. and he really guided me when I was working in China as well as when I first came here. Um, he and I had a really good relationship about what courses I can take to benefit. Um, the reason why it took uh, mass communication and journalism <coughs> is because we both felt that the bank is very strong in the finance and economic talent, but very weak in anthropology, history, and particularly connecting local communities with the bank policy and advocate for the local communities to express what they really want from those investments. So I was going to be that bridge between the local communities and the local government to the World Bank and their experts. That's why I got into mass communication, and that also was his advice. So throughout the year when he was um, you know, uh, still consulting for the bank, we worked on some of my ideas as a business, and as well as in general. When you're in Washington, where do you go for fun? Where do you meet people? How do you establish yourself as someone that people can tap into for resources? So this is very basic, but when you're in a new city and you really don't, there's no Facebook or Instagram at that time, it's very hard as a student to go outside your um, school and your community and to establish yourself. So how do you become an entrepreneur if you don't know what is lacking in that community? That's why, um, for me, having a mentor, even before you become an entrepreneur is important. Then you can imagine, once you start, where do you meet them? You go to trade show, you find someone has an interesting booth, or came up as a name for someone uh, as an expert. So the next mentor in my life was the guy who owns the world's uh, first fragrance and uh, dye color factory. His name is Peter French. Peter French became my mentor by showing me how to make fragrance candles and what are the way that candle wax and colors interact. And to today, I call on him when I have any questions. So mentorship is, uh, can, can have a certain structure. You know, you can meet with them in a, in a set up way that you meet maybe once a quarter face to face. But it can also be with today's technology on FaceTime, on a phone call, with emails. Um, as long as both of you acknowledge that this is something rewarding. And why is it rewarding for someone like me or Mr. Peter French to help someone like everyone here? And this is where I like to use my quote. I make candles, so I know a lot about candles. And Dr. Perman would agree with me. A candle loses nothing when you light up another. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a zero-sum game. I don't lose anything by sharing with you. Most of the time, we want to share with people working in our organizations or in other organizations because I want to find that person I can pass on the Bhutan one day. 
it would be a disaster if none of the people ever come to me and ever want to work with me as the one that wants to dream of getting that put on one day, right? So the, this whole idea of mentorship costs time, is very difficult, and maybe this person is too busy, doesn't have time for me as a startup person or on a lower um, level of my work. That is absolutely a myth. I find that when you find someone in the right time of their career or their schedule and be thoughtful about their time, be very open about what you need, it's always, don't, don't go to someone first and say, find me a job. Do you think that's going to work? I want that job. Can you get me that job? That's not how it works. Can you please tell me I just gave a speech, uh, you know, I just gave a presentation. What do you think I can improve? That's the way you start engaging someone. Do you mind coaching me? I'm a little scared of the next presentation. Do you mind coaching me how to get over my, my, my fear? Um, or after your um, review, probably, and you say, is there something that you didn't tell me that you want to tell me, but you feel maybe I'm not ready? I'm up for it. Let me know what you, what you think in addition. Those are ways, examples of how you open yourself to that possibility and say, do you mind if we meet for coffee twice a month? Or that's a lot, <laughs> not twice a month, um, every two months. Do you mind if I you know, pick your brain on some ideas I have about this new plan? Those are the little ways that step by step you let yourself be known. So I'm sure there's a lot that you guys share with each other too and share with me, but that to me is um, absolutely the right thing to do. Great advice. So you finally started talking about candles, mate. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean candles, uh, even I know they're as old as the hills. And uh, you made a fortune out of it, to be very blunt about it. Uh, I know you attribute the success of a company and your success to what we call innovation. Uh, the fact that from the very beginning, you did things differently from anywhere else, uh, from anyone else. So maybe you could speak to that, the role of innovation, the importance of innovation in having a very successful venture. I feel for all the startups, uh, all the dreamers and doers in this podium or in this, in this group. Um, as we know, um, society has progressed to such that we have the ability to know what's happening around us in terms of inventions, in terms of quality of a product, of a brand, a new brand breaking up almost instantly. So the chances for true success is at some point becoming a higher mark for, 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 for your creativity or getting into a business at one time. But at the same time, I feel it's also come down the barrier because there's so much out there to inspire us, right? You don't have to be a candle maker, as the example of me, to be the, one of the best innovators in the candle industry. You could be a disruptor for the candle industry. So that's exactly what I did. What you did not know sometimes was the most beneficial thing. So when I started in um, 1994 making candles, you probably remember Yankee Candle, which actually is now owned by the same company. And you remember there is Candle Light, uh, there is Blythe, there is Candle Party. And one thing they are in common is as if they got the memo, every candle comes in the same grandma looking jar. <laughs> right? They got the memo. Even in the color, they got the same palette of the burgundy, the hunter green, the blue, and it's raspberry, it's cinnamon, and even the label. I swear, if you see the label without seeing the names, they could be the same. They could be the 10 companies could share the same brand because that's what's successful, right? Why do you change a thing when it's successful? If you look at psychology, it is true when things are taking off, everything that looks similar as a successful brand is going to benefit in that halo factor. But when you're looking at a success, if you are far-sighted, you know that that's going to peak. And what's going to immediately have to happen for brand is to embrace the disruption themselves, to create that disruption and be the next, go into the next wave of growth. Most big companies, as you probably can imagine, will never do that. A, they 
build a whole mechanism from design to production on that volume item. Yankee Candle, for example, I knew because now we are one company, they have that jar still, you probably realize, right? That jar, they don't even warehouse them in a factory. The factory will receive trucks, comes in in the morning, empty, and they go through production lines, and they leave. That's the kind of jar they're using. One jar fits all. All fragrances, all the people in the world use the same jar. So they are invested in that technology and in that setup. What they are missing is the jars that you're looking at um, on the table. That's our wellness jar. Why? First, we have two sizes, three sizes, and then we have colors. So you can't just bring a whole truckload and fill them up. We don't have that luxury. But what we do have is what consumers are looking for. Some color, some contemporary look, and the kind of idea that inspire people not only to buy it, but to keep it as a safe stake. Many people use our jar and they keep it to put flowers there, you know, for keeping coins or as a pencil holder. It's a decor item because it fits their home now. So what I'm trying to say is that because I don't have that building idea that I'm married to something, I can allow myself to disrupt and I can allow myself to innovate. So candles to me is not a boring wax in a jar. It has a thousand formats. It has a thousand possibilities. And I even broke the barrier between candles and design and between candles and wellness. Um, we have, a, we have a, a wonderful speaker this afternoon about the importance of wellness. And one of the things we designed is to tap into that need for wellness. As you probably know, fragrance does give you a certain impact. When we smell lavender, we don't get excited, but we fall asleep. But when we smell orange, we certainly don't fall asleep. There is a definite science with how fragrance triggers the, the kind of emotions in person. So when we want to have a romantic evening, we don't set up lavender, do we? <laughs> we don't set up, no. So here's a guess. The one who's going to win is going to get a special candle from me. I don't have that candle, but I promise to bring it. So who knows it's a romantic scent? Raise your hand. Come on, come on. I know you all have heard it. That lady in the pink. Elaine Elaine, my God. It's a very seductive fragrance. We're talking about very, very seductive. I'm just saying, you know, when your husband is coming home, <laughs> Dr. Perman might know there's something for the fall season that we all burn and we all eat. What's that fragrance? Even the President Obama knows that. <laughs> pumpkin I'm, pie. I'm feeling pumpkin stupid. <laughs> All right, nobody gets the candle today, but the lady for Ilan Ilan, I have an Ilan Ilan probably in, in, my, in my house. But pumpkin, not just pumpkin, pumpkin pie has nutmeg and cinnamon. And this is an aphrodisiac for men. So <laughs> remember that. But that's why you like, you guys your, your husband likes it. <laughs> Research has shown, no matter where in this country, as long as we can see a pumpkin in the parking lot, we're ready for pumpkin pie. No amount of pumpkin pie fragrances I have is enough for our country. So we have probably 10 different pumpkin pies. We call it different things. It's always the best seller. So moving back to innovation, if you understand. I was wondering what I asked. <laughs> I what I'm saying is that don't restrict yourself to go on the same lane innovators try to look at the lane as only a guide, right? You need to think candles can enhance mood. You know that we can even melt wax and give, use the soil wax to massage, right? If you heard about that. So all of a sudden, it's a mood enhancer. It's a way to feel well. It's a way to feel balanced and harmony. It is a way to make you feel strong if you're smelling a certain kind of you know, uh, ozonic fragrances with uh, a, a mix of um, uh, what we call citrusy notes. So different families has proven different functionalities. You know, Coco Chanel is one of the most innovative women, not only in fashion, but little to known to many people. Chanel number one, I mean number, f number five, was sold almost five bottles every second in the world. 
five, five bottles. And why is that? It's because it's seductive. It has all the notes that make us feel powerful as, as a woman, but still celebrate our fem, feminine um, you know, strength. So I, I think innovation comes from looking at those um, lenses, but being able to disrupt and being able to connect another industry uh, to what we are doing. Is a long answer to your question. Well, uh, <laughs> personally, I can't wait to see uh, tomorrow's edition of UMB News. <laughs> Aphrodisia for men. Yeah. That's the title. <laughs> well, moving on. Uh, <laughs> May, you and I have uh, talked about work-life balance and uh, in our conversations, you've correctly pointed out to me, very correctly, uh, that I have the pleasure of having four children, like you, and I certainly never had to sacrifice my professional aspirations uh, for them. Uh, when my children were young, yes, of course, uh, my wife did all the heavy lifting at home, despite having a career, uh, typical for women. Uh, you've mentioned you have two children, two stepchildren, a husband, uh, and you got into this a little bit, but I think we'd like to hear more if you may share it. How did you, I mean, you've been incredibly successful, and yet you've been very successful as a mother and as a wife. Uh, how did you do that? How did you figure out the right work-life balance to get all of this accomplished? Um, I don't think I figured it out. Even this morning, I was writing a note to my, uh, my younger son, Michael's um, literature teacher, apologizing that Michael think he has turned in the homework when he didn't. So those things um, never go away. I told Dr. Perman last week when I was here that when I was with my children when they were young, I miss working. I felt bad that I should finish that design uh, you know, brief or I should approve something. And then when I was working, I knew that I missed my son's first walk, their first speech. Um, I never put together the cute book about when I see them talking the first time or you know, when they embrace me and say something nice. Um, all the things, a lot of you have those you know, memorable things in your hand. I probably only have them in my head. Um, so do I have regrets that I could have done something and maybe slow down a little bit when they were young? Um, I do. At this moment, do I regret um, any of the things that I didn't do for them? Maybe they could be a little bit more nurtured, you know, they could be giving a little bit more push. Um, probably. But the one thing I do know is that it doesn't take a business owner to feel that way. All of you probably felt the same way. As long as we are working and having our family. So that gives me confidence. And that really makes me feel we are all in this together. It's true, uh, Dr. Perman was right. When something happened, he probably doesn't feel extremely guilty that he's traveling when one of the kids got sick. But when you're traveling, particularly like I do, I used to travel a lot to Europe and to Asia, I really can't come back to even take them to, um, to the hospital I miss most of their um, annual checkups, even though th this was according to my schedule. Uh, Shas here, has took, uh, he's driving for the kids uh, when they were growing up. He took them to uh, more checkups. And my kids are Chinese, so they look at him and say, oh, your wife is Chinese? And he said, no, 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 that's not my kids. <laughs> not my kids. These are not my kids. So it happens a lot. And do I regret? Um, I do. But one thing I do feel we should give us our, uh, the, the allowances is to build some kind of network around us. Um, in my culture, um, it's, very, it's very common that we ask our in-laws or our parents to help with the baby. Because then, when they're getting older, we want to step in to help them as well. In, in, my, in my view, it, it does take a village to raise your children. It's healthy to have that village because different people brought different perspectives and strength and texture to our kids. So they're not singular, they're not one dimensional, that their relationship is thriving because of Shah's, because of my family, who's actually not there uh, for me because they're all the way in China. So if I have my family here, I would love for my mom to step in or my dad or my sister. 
Um, so that's one thing is allow yourself to outsource some of your job because it's okay. My sounds turns out fine. One of them is going to go to U Chicago um, very soon. Um, he's a very strong, um, confident boy, very happy. Never complained once that I'm not in some of the things that you know other parents would be. So I feel that outsourcing is important if you can. The second thing is really try to uh, give the kids a sense of ownership. Um, I know I'm preaching to the choirs. More and more, our kids are so nurtured. Um, they have after school activity. We become an Uber driver without getting paid. Um, they don't even, I remember one of my friends actually say, here's my 14 year old. He was here, I was opposite on the other side. And he said, dad, can you make a U-turn and pick me up? And his dad said, only if you pay me $20. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of relationship we become. To our, and then they get on the car, they start looking at their phone, right? So does that help them? No. They don't own, they don't own the, the, the responsibility of getting their own edu, uh, transportation from A to Z. How will they ever grow up to be a man or woman that understand the value of work? So I think making sure the kids can step in as, as young as possible. I was cooking for my family before I uh, left for boarding school at 10 because my, my parents can't come back for lunch. And I cook for my older sister because she was getting ready for college. And I was the one cooking for, for, him, for her. So our kids can take on a lot more if they can figure out how to uh, um, hack her into a system of yours on your phone, you know they can cook. <laughs> Um, the last thing I want to say is I do feel, and I think Dr. Perman and the management team understand that, is working flexible uh, in the workforce has become such an uh, important thing. Not only is it important for moms and women, it's also important for men. I believe many men want to be participating in their lives, uh, children's lives. Now we have, uh, before I left, we installed a paternity leave for men, right? So for two months, um, our employees can take two months paid for, of course it's not mandate, but for my, for my company, we, we gave two months um, paternity for men when they have children. And I have a lot of employees who are first generation immigrants from England, from Germany, they don't have any family here. It's they, the, the wife and husband taking care of sometimes twins. So uh, that's the challenge that society needs to also embrace is that if we truly want women to have the same opportunity, then let's give it to the men as well. So they are roped into this um, and they'll become better parents, I think, co-parent. So I have uh, one question left uh, before we see what's on people's minds here, May, uh, and that's about the future, uh, your future. Uh, you've sold a very successful company. Uh, I think you've freed up some time for yourself. <laughs> In addition to all the demands which, of course, we will make on you uh, in doing your good work here, what's next for you? Um, I actually think we can go back, you know, from opportunity for women perspective because I'm also in the same area, right? I'm just finishing one chapter of my life. I'm starting a second one. So what is there for us? for women and women startups. I'm, I'm, I'm running a startup again. To me, um, the globalization, um, we all understand there's a trade war going on between the US and China. So the government's uh, locked into that kind of war. But what does that mean for all of us as citizens, as um, startup owners, or people that wanting to seek opportunity? I actually think rather than focusing on the headlines, we should focusing on what's opening up. Traditionally, we only have one market, which is the US market. But I do feel with the globalization, the marketplace has significantly increased. It is also international. <laughs> rather than thinking you're selling to a very um, finite group of people, there are opportunities of selling to China now, right? It's a, growing middle class country with four or five hundred million consumers. Women consumers still dominant there as well as uh, here. Then you go to the rest of Asia. There's growing um, wealth in Vietnam where we have a factory, in India. Um, and what does that mean? All of these means bigger market, bigger customers. Second thing that I think is very important coming with that trend is that 
when the US and Western European countries move the jobs of manufacturing from here and Europe to Asia, that's what I would say the first migration of production. Men at that time most often take advantage of those because they, they took the risk, they traveled to those countries, they established supply chains, and they become very successful in that process. This is a chance for women now. We must not wait to be left out in this movement of migration. We have to take on those challenges, get yourself a plane ticket, travel to those areas in South America, in Asia, in Africa, where very big uh, movement is happening thanks to the supply chain migration. It's not just consumer product. You heard about uh, Apple moving from China to India, right? There's a lot of supply chain that's going to start moving in those waves. So that's another opportunity. The third opportunity that I feel that is even more encouraging is the access to capital. It used to be finance really comes from your very region. You know, Baltimore uh, startups go to Baltimore banks. Um, Washington, D.C. startups goes to Washington, D.C. banks. I'm sitting on at least two startup funding um, uh, fund. They're all early stage. And we are looking at women and men in startup stage for the first round of funding, looking at very international investors because the, the, the appetite for risk has really raised over the last two decades. Any innovative ideas to solve problems, people are willing to write you a check even before you see any results. So I feel this is the time for entrepreneurs to take that um, idea and really run with it because there are plenty of people who's going to applaud you with, with actual investment. So for me, um, coming back to me, with that, you know, exciting opportunity for, for a lot of people. What do I want to do the most? I was thinking about that. Um, and I have ideas, but now I can tell you, um, I just launched my company. It's called Meishi uh, Corporate. The, the reason why I call it is because my name is very short. And I think everyone does not need to be burdened with a longer name. The second thing is um, what I want to do is to build an online community and a marketplace for women businesses. Of course, I would not exclude men businesses, but the idea that I understand women's challenges for access to capital, access to market, um, understanding of logistic challenges, understanding of how to clear customs in the US market and also the Chinese market will help, hopefully with my knowledge and my background, I can help more women to grow a little bit more. As you probably know, I was reading the notes from Jennifer. There are only probably 90%, probably 90% of women-owned business is under a million. That's a staggering number. Under, I think under 5%, minority women-owned business is over a million. Mm -hmm. So we are, we're really uh, challenged when we are really about ready to take off on the wrong way. So how do we build a wrong way for the women that is supportive, that really focus on their strength versus dragging down on their weaknesses. So let them focus on their competitive advantages of design, ideas, execution on their key items. And let the rest of the uh, infrastructure, um, some of the accounting uh, capabilities, reporting capabilities, logistic capabilities, to be shared function. Right? We're very good at sharing. Can we build that kind of shared function so that women entrepreneurs don't have to spend all the energy and resources to build something from scratch, such as a website? So these are things I'm going to start thinking. You're all welcome to visit my website, meishi.com. It's very easy. Share your dreams, your stories, and that's how we are going to build this community. I don't know how successful it's going to be. It sounds like a very challenging lofty goal, but if it's not lofty, we'll not do it. I just have a feeling it's going to be wildly successful. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. So please do um, check on the, the site. I have already doers and dreamers. I featured people that really take the leap and trying to do something different with their lives. So you're all welcome to share the stories with me and my team and, um, you know, stay tuned. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Perlman. Well, the thanks are ours, but I'm not ready to let you go. Uh, 
we have time for questions. Can you just describe even your experience of your first risk and what that was like um, to make that decision to even quit that job not knowing where you were going next? Um, and when you said you were locked out of the system, I mean, that's a big risk. So what, what was that experience like? So I may not know uh, every single risk decisions you could have made. I know that the, the, the risk my husband, Alessandro, took was sometimes on the topics, right? He would spend two years sometimes on one topic. He's an economist. Rather than chasing some of the more popular ones like, um, you know, the rate, uh, he's an he's, he's a expert on interest rate for government. So he, he really advised uh, central banks on their interest rate policy. So rather than follow that script, that lane, he decided two years ago to follow what does um, you know, the bitcoins and the, the, the blockchain can do for central banks of the world or actually you know, monetary policy. And that was, nobody has been studying two years ago, actually two and a half years ago. And nobody even wants to spend that kind of time. And clearly, there's no track in their uh, academia. You know, all the economists kind of know each other, like you know, certain doctors for certain areas. And um, he was the first to do that. And now, almost everybody, when they are talking about policy, JP Morgan uh, just decided to launch their own, um, you know, own currency in that area. So all of a sudden, he has all the people calling on him because he's been on that path giving uh, discussions and write some papers on that. So I think even in academia, the risk to take and the reward is huge, but the failure is also pretty daunting. So um, for me, I think choosing to actually um, leave the whole idea of being a diplomat was the hardest one. It's a passion of mine. For 10 years, I was dreaming of which country I would be the ambassador for. Um, I didn't really think about not even thinking of working in foreign service. So um, being able to say, well, it looks like um, the future is just as unknown. As you know, not everybody become diplomats. So it certainly was an unknown. And to really lose a lot of connections of what I've been doing, it just seems that you need to balance the reward and the sacrifice. The one thing I know all of us would, would agree with is we would never want to regret in our 80s that we didn't do something because it's not safe. I think that's, we always have to imagine what that must feel. You know, I was with a friend whose daughter took three years to go to Columbia Law just so that at this moment she said, Mom, I will never be a lawyer. I just hate being a lawyer. And then there's the exam, right, the bar. And this is what her mother said. You could choose not to be a lawyer, but imagine how would you explain yourself that you can't even dare to take um, a bar exam. You would always say you don't have that courage, that you don't even give yourself a chance to fail. You're afraid of failure. So that's what I think even for us that are in the professionals that we know we're not going to another industry or another field or transfer into a government job. We want to stay in this, um, in the academia world. I feel there are many, many choices where risk is involved, where we need to allow ourselves to take those risks. 